Hi, welcome back to McNally's Musket Missive. I'm Harry McNally, and this is a musket. Uh, before we begin, I want to start with a correction. Uh, previous episode, I stated that the uh, Charlottesville pattern musket ceased production at Harper's Ferry in 1819. That's incorrect. It was 1816. Uh, and uh, the reasons for that I'll go into today, but uh, the error was made because I misread one of my sources uh, to the point that I actually stated the opposite of what my source was saying. That's how badly I misread it. Uh, a correction will appear in the description of that video. And whenever I do make a mistake, rest assured, I will address it. So let's talk about, uh, well, today, that is, we're talking about the Model 1816. But before I go into that, I need to talk about the predecessor, the Model 1812, or standard model of 1815, depending on whose nomenclature you prefer. Now, the reason I'm not talking about that today in, d in depth is simply because I don't have one. I like having the freedom of being able to photograph it from whatever angle I think is necessary and not having to rely on uh, public source photos or whatever photos I can beg, borrow, and steal from uh, my contacts on the internet. Uh, so, the uh, model of 1812 or standard model of 1815 uh, had its beginnings in the War of 1812, or if you prefer, the War of Northern Aggression. Uh, production of the Charlevoix pattern wasn't really what the War Department wanted. And also, there was a large quality control failure at Springfield that uh, I would love to go into once I have a Springfield Charlevoix pattern to show you. Um, that, that re required them to rethink uh, the, the model of the musket to include things like standardization of uh, everything. Um, they chased a lot of uh, the revisions made that, that the French made for their uh, Charleville model 1777, which we never actually had. We got the older 63s and 66s, uh, and that's what we based our muskets on. The 1777 was, it was probably the pinnacle of flintlock arms design. Uh, the French continued using it until the end of the flintlock era. That's how good it was. But, uh, A lot of those revisions, however, didn't make it into the Model 1812 slash standard Model of 1815 and had to wait for the Model 1816 to come about. But the key changes to the Model 1812 slash standard Model 1815 over the Charlottesville were barrel band retention. Uh, instead of having the barrel band spring behind the barrel band, like the Charlottesville pattern with that post and hole arrangement that I just imagine had to have been hell to produce, uh, they finally figured out, let's put it in front, all you've got to do is cut a slot in the stock for it and, and press fit it in and you're good to go. Now obviously you couldn't do that with the front barrel band because there's no stock in front of it to, to uh, put a band spring. Uh, another change they made was to the overall barrel length. The Charleville pattern had a nominal barrel length of 44 inches. The 1812-1815 the brought that down to about 42. And those changes um, carried over into the model of 1816. Now, the big difference between the model of 1816 and the uh, previous models was the brass pan. Now, you're thinking to yourself, what is this? This is a percussion conversion of a model 1816. Um, in the 1840s, they realized that uh, the rock banger was just terrible, and we should replace it with something far more reliable, something that will fire in the rain. Um, I'm not going to go in-depth into percussion conversions today. Uh, that's going to be a separate episode, but I do need to address it because this is clearly not a rock banger. Um, but it will serve my purposes because most of the changes are visible and what's not I can, I can make do with photographs. Uh, so they changed the, the pan to one made of brass. Uh, that's significant because brass corrodes differently from iron and uh, well, black powder is hydrophilic, it attracts moisture. And black powder fouling, if you've ever dealt with it, is a nightmare. Try as you might, you'll never really get rid of all of it, so you'll always have something around attracting moisture. And brass corrodes much differently than, uh, than iron does. Brass corrosion can generally be wiped away, whereas iron corrosion, that's rust and pitting. So that change extends the surface length of the arm. Additionally, uh, it, it's hard to tell with, the, with this uh, percussion conversion model, I'll have a photograph for you. Uh, the pan was inclined for uh, better and more reliable ignition. Again, if you've ever fired a rock banger, you'll, you'll know that flintlock ignition 
is more black magic than technology and science. Uh, you've got to you've got to hope that the sparks ignite your 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 uh, your priming charge. You got to hope that that goes down the touch hole correctly and ignites your main charge. It's not. It wasn't the most reliable system. It, it was what they had. And it's also why they got rid of the rock bangers as fast as they possibly could. Why do I call it a rock banger? Because they're literally banging rocks together to make sparks. Uh, in addition to the change of the pan, the overall lock design was changed. Uh, it, it, it tapers to a point at the end and doesn't have that little uh, teat at the end of the point that the uh, Charlevoix patterns had. It's concave at the end and flat at the front. It, th those are design changes that were made to, to copy this as much as possible off of the Model 1777. Unfortunately, all I can find on why they made these changes was, that's, was because that's what the French are doing. Uh, I need to find some sources on Charleville musket design, apparently, and unfortunately, so far, my searches haven't really turned up much. If you out there know of any books and sources about the development of the French Charleville muskets, please, by all means, let me know. Uh, it's kind of infuriating to uh, see that um, they made these changes, and the, and the reasons why were, well, that's what the French did. Okay, well, why did the French do that? That doesn't exist within my sources. And there are some unanswered questions in there. <clears throat> Otherwise, with the exception of some uh, dimensional changes to the stock, um, a rock banger is a rock banger. Uh, that being said, I, if you're interested in knowing the full technical dis uh, details of these muskets, you know, uh, length of pull, uh, comb dimensions, th things like that, please let me know. This, chat, this channel is intended for uh, a wider, uh, a more broad audience who may not know or care about that kind of information, but I want to keep you guys happy. And if, you want, and if there are those of you who want to know the technical specifications, I'm more than willing to make a supplement. So yeah, other than the changes that I mentioned and some minute changes to uh, you know, stock geometry and everything, it's the same as everything else. It's a 69 caliber uh, smooth bore muzzle loading Flintlock, not this one. Uh, production of these began at Springfield in 1818 and at Harpers Ferry in 1819. Um, the biggest, most important change for the 1816 uh, family of muskets was that these were made with an eye towards parts interchangeability. Parts interchangeability obviously became important after the War of 1812. I would imagine that during a major war, repair of arms was impeded severely by the fact that the arms that they had were, by and large, handmade, bespoke, artisanal pieces. Uh, the machines, uh, machine tools existed, but they weren't utilizing them to their fullest extent, and they realized this. Uh, the Model 1816 was designed and developed and would continue being developed with an eye for complete parts interchangeability. Uh, they wouldn't quite get it with this model, and subsequent models got closer and closer. By the, the time of the Civil War, they felt they had complete parts interchangeability. Um, how interchangeable they are, I'm not entirely certain. Um, I would imagine some hand fitting were still, was still required. But for, the, for, their, for their purposes, uh, it's much easier to reach into a bin of parts to replace a broken tumbler or a sear than it would be to have to take one and then fit it f and that realize it doesn't fit and fit it some more. It, interchangeable parts was a major leap forward in arms development, and for that matter, manufacturing in general. Uh, so there's also some nomenclature confusion over the Model 1816 family. There exists the term Model 1822. That is simultaneously correct and incorrect, it turns out. Um, there is contemporary uh, literature referring to those models made, uh, um, those muskets made after 1822 as the Model 1822 in official language and in, in official documents. Uh, but there's also official documents that continue to refer to those arms as Model 1816s. Uh, the reason for that is that a survey was done and they determined that the muskets made prior to 1822 weren't as parts interchangeable as they wanted them to be. Uh, whereas those made after 1822 were, were just great. So as a result, you've got this new nomenclature of the Model 1822, those that meet 
this uh, this rigorous demand for uh, and 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 requirements for parts uh, interchangeability that the older 1816s didn't have. And as a result of the confusion over the nomenclature, you'll see model 1816, model 1822, model 1816 22, which one's which is actually my favorite. Um, all are simultaneously correct and not, in the sense that all of them are supported by primary documentation of the period. It's, yeah. So, in addition with the, the uh, designation of Model 1822, they also made a significant change in that from 1822 to 1832, these weapons were browned at the armory. Uh, they were given a chemical finish uh, to, instead of, instead of bare metal, well, it became brown. Uh, the idea being was that um, a, f a finish on the, on, the right, on the musket would give it better rust protection. Turns out it didn't. So, starting in 1832, they did away with that. Uh, they would try it again interchangeably every now and again, but uh, for the most part, Armory Bright was the standard finish for U.S. muskets for most of uh, the musket period. So that's about everything for this. Let's get it over to the light box and I can highlight specific features, um, do a comparison on the percussion conversion and the rock banger. Again, that'll be a separate episode when I go in depth, but I can't not address it. So starting out on the right side of the musket. Um, at first glance, it looks very much the same as any other Charleville derived musket. Um, you know, the the barrel bands are the same, the band springs have moved, uh, the brass pan. Uh, obviously this one looks a lot different because it's a percussion conversion, but other than that, uh, the key differences between this and the previous Charleville patterns are minor uh, stock dimension changes, uh, shape of uh, the, the lock panel that doesn't have quite the same uh, point that the old one did. Uh, just minor differences that really only matter to collectors. Uh, moving on to the left side, we see, you know, the same elongated S side plate, uh, you know, more of the same, really. Uh, here we have the lock mechanism itself. Obviously, this is very different from how the original configuration looks. And thankfully, I have some fo this photograph here from the uh, Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of American History uh, with a Harbors Ferry Model 1816 in original flint uh, configuration. Uh, going back to the percussion conversion, uh, you'll see that the pan has been uh, cut flat and, and uh, filed smooth. Uh, they also put in a, a little uh, piece of brass into the uh, depression in the uh, pan itself um, to cover up where the touch hole used to be. They also filled and uh, filed that smooth as well. Uh, I'll go more into detail with the changes uh, when I talk about percussion conversions, but I can't not mention it, as I mentioned, as I said before. Uh, moving forward to the uh, rear barrel band, we'll see that the band itself is much the same. The band spring has now moved forward of the band. Uh, same deal with the middle band. And the front band is pretty much identical to the original uh, Charlottesville patterns. As I said, there's no stock in front of the band spring to move the barrel band spring to, so... Also note that the uh, bayonet stud is on top of the barrel this time as opposed to underneath as it was on my uh, Harper's Ferry Charleville pattern. Uh, this was one of the changes that they made uh, starting with the model 1812 slash standard model of 1815. Consistent placement of the bayonet stud. Uh, a lot of the Charleville patterns you could flip a coin and uh, determine where it would go. Some of them had it on top, some of them had it on the bottom. Uh, some Springfield models actually had the bayonet uh, soldered to the, ba to the barrel. Uh, they really didn't make any firm choices on what they wanted to do. Uh, now this picture, as I said before, uh, I wasn't going to go too much into detail into the percussion changes, but this is neat and I wanted to point it out. You notice all that pitting around the cone, and the, yes, that is a replacement cone. Um, that is an indication of some serious use. As I mentioned in the video, uh, black powder is hydrophilic, attracts moisture, and, uh, corro and uh, promotes corrosion. This kind of pitting around the cone suggests that this weapon saw a lot of use after it was converted to percussion, which suggests this weapon was used in the Civil War. Uh, at the beginning of the Civil War, there was not a whole lot of rifled muskets available um, in 
when you consider the size of the armies being being raised. And as a result, a lot of old war horses like uh, these percussion conversion uh, Model 1816s were brought out of storage and issued for frontline service. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, smoothbore muskets uh, were what General Grant's army used out west until Vicksburg fell, that, and uh, they uh, replaced their smoothbores with captured Confederate rifle muskets. Uh, here we go, we see closer the uh, S-shaped side uh, plate and uh, the uh, inspection cartouche visible on the stock, which is very pleasing to me. A lot of times th those wear off quite easily. Um, E.B. standing for uh, Mr. Uh, Elzebur Bates, who worked at the Springfield Armory uh, beginning in 1815. He was, uh, he later became uh, the master armorer of, the, of, of Springfield, and uh, his uh, mark on this musket shows that he was the one who inspected it and uh, approved it for use. Production of the Model 1816-22 would continue with Springfield until 1840 and at Harpers Ferry until about 1844. Uh, Springfield began development of the 1840 musket and Harpers Ferry skipped that one in favor of the 1842. And thankfully I have both of those arms so that I no longer have to skip over content to stay in with what I have on hand. Uh, again, I absolutely want to go back and fill in those gaps, the, the Springfield Charleville patterns, and the, uh, the standard model of 1815 slash model 1812. Uh, I just, at the moment I can't, I'm made of meat, not dollar bills. But um, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Um, I know it wasn't quite as long as the previous episode was. That's mostly because this musket, there was nothing hugely different about this and the previous. It's just another rock banging Charlottesville pattern. Uh, future episodes will have a lot more development and change to talk about. Um, but in the meantime, I got to work with what I have. Um, thanks for watching. Uh, please, if you haven't already, like this video, sh uh, subscribe to the channel for, the al for algorithm purposes. Comment below, again, drives the algorithm. And also, please consider sponsoring me on Patreon. Uh, the link is in the description. Uh, that's it for today. Thanks for watching. Bye.